uh, introduce the introducer online. I'm going to go through a couple layers here. Um, and I wanted to uh, uh, let you know about the organization that's sponsoring this event, Jewish Voice for Peace. It's the San Antonio chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace that's the sponsor. Um, my name is Judith Norman. Um, I'm a professor at Trinity University and an organizer of Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace is a national grassroots organization that works to end the Israeli occupation of Palestine and to promote peace and justice for all peoples in the Middle East. If you're interested in learning more about the work of Jewish Voice for Peace, we have some literature. I see most of you have found it on the literature table in back, which has some information pertinent to uh, the topic as well as sort of promotional literature from JDP. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace understands that the root cause of the violence in Israel-Palestine looks a lot like the root cause of much political violence around the world. Imperialism, militarism, dehumanizing rhetoric, and the unchecked powers of corporation that feed off of and feed into war, surveillance, incarceration. This panel will seek to explore these factors at the border and in international context. Uh, JDP will be hosting a second panel as well on Friday, January 25th, where we're going to be examining more closely some of the connections between San Antonio and the Israel-Palestine region. Um, to start things off, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Harry Gunkel. Harry Gunkel is a San Antonio native who lived in occupied Palestine from 2007 to 2012. He's a member of Jewish Voice Peace, San Antonio for Justice in Palestine, and the Episcopal Palestine Israel Network. He continues to make regular visits to Gaza and the West Bank, most recently in 2017. Thank you, Harry. Welcome, everyone, to this Dream Week conversation about crises occurring in borders. We're very grateful to be part of this unique two week Dream Week event in San Antonio. Everyone here today is familiar with events at the nearby border between the U.S. and Mexico. Whether by proximity, or by cultural kinship, or by place of origin, our community is deeply involved and or deeply affected by what is happening there. So our purpose today is not to describe those events. They are well known. Rather, we want to use this time together for a conversation about some of the repercussions and implications of those events at the border, and to examine ways that people and governments respond to them. We have all seen the response of our government to people coming to the border wanting to enter this country. Military troops were deployed. They laid out razor wire barriers. They shot tear gas across the border at assembled people, and they had clearance to shoot to kill. Families have been separated and children detained, then sent to foster homes all over the country with no plan or purpose to reunite the families. The rhetoric of officialdom has been strident and explosive, but rarely compassionate. The situation is called a crisis and a national emergency. We are told that we are being invaded and that the caravans include drug dealers, criminals, and terrorists. Information has been misused, and the situation is at the heart of a government shutdown and loss of livelihood for federal workers. Naturally, the focus for most of us has been on the border to the south. But what is happening there is not isolated or unique. In fact, just yesterday, as on every Friday since March, we saw very similar events at the barrier between Israel and the Gaza Strip. The use of military force, demonization and mischaracterization of people seeking justice, targeting and singling out of children, and political exploitation. But why bring up Israel and Palestine in our conversation today about the subject of the border to the South? Events that are so far away and seem unrelated and irrelevant. 
But as Judith has already pointed out, the same root causes are at play in both places. Today we hope to illuminate the commonalities of cause and intentions that show why those far away events matter to us here in South Texas also. To guide us through this conversation, we have an expert panel. Immediately to my right is Giovanni Reyes. Giovanni is a 14-year Army veteran, a local activist, a member of About Face Veterans Against the War, a veteran-led organization of the 9-11 generation dedicated to ending the forever wars. And he's also a member of Mijente, the Latinx justice movement. He holds a BS in criminal justice with an associate's in military science, an MS in international relations, and an MS in instructional technology. On the far end of the panel is Alvaro Rafael. Alvaro is an artist and activist from El Salvador and has worked with several Salvadoran youth empowerment programs that confront the issue of drug abuse and violence. He donates his art skills to diverse human rights movements in San Antonio, and he currently enjoys being a soccer coach. <coughs> to Giovanni's right is Elaine Cohen. Elaine holds a BA from Smith College with a major in religion and a minor in women's studies. Since moving to Austin in 1997, she has been active in various immigrant rights groups and served as consultant for the Hutto Visitation Program of Grassroots Leadership. She currently is part of the organizing team of the Houston chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace and volunteers at Posada Esperanza. And Dr. Javi Lanur is a San Antonio-based scholar who has researched public perceptions of Islam. Her most recent research examined how San Antonians from diverse backgrounds talk about Islam in relation to the 2016 presidential election. This research was the foundation of the documentary theater, theater production titled To Be Honest, Voices on Islam in an American City, which premiered at the McNay and also performed at Trinity University and the Joe Long Theater. Habiba currently teaches at Trinity University. This is really a five-star panel. Let's welcome them. Our panelists will address several things. First, what happens when an event becomes militarized? Does it help? Is it a solution? What implications does it have through the society at large? Is it compassionate? Second, who are the people most affected by these events? What brought them to this time and place? What are some of their experiences? Is there room for compassion in an immigration crisis when we are constantly told that it is a security issue? Third, how is our perception and response to the events and the people involved affected or even formed by public discourse? And does that discourse have consequences of its own? A recent media report characterized Dream Week as addressing the question, what makes us human? So the question before us today is not what makes us safe. It is not what makes us powerful. It is not what makes us American. It is what makes us human. So let's begin. <clears throat> Giovanni. You're a veteran of the U.S. Army with first-hand exposure to the culture of militarism. How does use of the military at the border affect our perception of the situation and influence the course of events? Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, you guys hear me? Hear me? Yeah. All right, uh, yes, uh, so I wrote a brief statement, and I read it and pretty much encompass uh, all all my thoughts into what's in the paper here, right? Yeah. All right, so, um, so to go into your question, uh, uh, let me, let, let's, let's go back to uh, a few months ago, back in October. Uh, October 2018, it was announced by the White House that 5,200 active duty soldiers would be, would be deployed to the U.S. Mexican border. They would join over 2,000 National Guard personnel that were already stationed there. J 
just for comparison, uh, is about the same troop level that is currently in Iraq right now, uh, about 5,000 soldiers. Uh, the stated purpose of this troop movement was to augment the over 9,000 strong customs and border patrol agents along the U.S. southern border to help cover the ports of entries. This was in response to the announcement of 3,007 or to 7,000 migrant marching towards the U.S. border seeking asylum. People mainly coming from countries in Central America where the U.S. has long has a long history of interventions there. More specifically, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Two of these countries being staunch U.S. allies. The crisis was presented in the media, specifically by the Trump administration, as a national emergency. One needing a military response because we were being invaded by courts of illegal bed, I believe, bent on doing harm to the American people. Keep in mind that Trump kicked off his presidential campaign by announcing that if made president, he will build a wall that Mexico will pay for, it will deport all leaders from the country. I believe the words that was used to describe the southern day are southern neighbors at a time where rapists, murderers, animals, and the implications were mainly that they're all either belonged to MS-13, or they were narco traffickers, or they were ISIS ter uh, terrorists. Um, also keep in mind that all the recent fear mongering and media hype about the imminent invasion of Latin American ports coming to take our lives and that military responses needed to protect us having to be around the U.S. midterm election. Right? Now, the talk today is about the 800,000 federal employees being furloughed without pay and being held as bargaining chips so that Congress can pass a bill funding the construction of this famous wall. Now, this wall has been constructed for the last 25 years. Right? I'm really mistaken. Uh, physically and virtually, started with the Clinton administration. Uh, president carried over to, to successive presidency up to Trump right now. Uh, this is a bipartisan venture, and plenty of profits being made by those companies who profit from this sort of things, including foreign companies. Some of them, one of them being an Israeli company known as Elbike Systems of America, who manufactures their hand drones that fly over the border. And it's currently being awarded a 145 million contract to construct fixed towers similar to uh, systems in Nogales, Arizona, similar to the ones that you see in Palestine and Gaza, etc. Right? All in all, the protecting of the border venture has cost the American taxpayers around 400, 400 million dollars. Now let's go back to the militarization of the border. San Antonio, aka U.S. military city, USA, helped organize the agile. LLK March, right? It's supposed to be the largest in the country. And Dream Week is part of that, that event, right? It's, it commemorates the work of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and his legacy. Um, so, I can't help but bring up one of the things that the LLK said in one of his last speeches at, at Riverside Baptist Church in New York, which we call the madness of U.S. militarism uh, often being on the side of the wealthy and creating health for the poor. There, there he rightfully pointed out that racism, extreme capitalism, and militarism is toxic to any society. Militarism can be described as a system that values all that is military, and military society is one that puts the needs of the military ahead of everything else and believes that the military is a solution to all problems and conflicts, right? Hence, why we send the troops down to the border, right? Because it seems to solve a uh, problem. Uh, now, the liberal argument is that these people are in search of a better life, and, as, and we as Americans have a tradition of opening our doors to the needy. The conservative argument is that we need to protect our borders, and, and immigrants need to follow our law. If we truly are compassionate city, we really need to get over this and take an objective, serious look what really drives millions of people around the world to leave their homes in masses, exposing themselves and their children to unknown danger, and be honest with ourselves to recognize our complicity in creating these top conditions. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, I should have mentioned, we're following the presentation by each panelist, we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So um, please. 
please hold your questions and um, I think we'll have time to, to address the other ones. I want to follow up on Giovanni's references to the involvement of Israel in all of this. We said at the outset we're, we're going to try to draw those parallels today. So um, sort of throughout we're going to be showing some images and I just want to the image you're looking at now on the left is a confrontation. It was either the Arizona or California border, I can't remember which, um, in December, between military and those folks who were standing in protest who were demonstrating. On the right are five Israeli tanks facing this child on the boundary between the Gaza Strip and Israel. Some of these images that we're going to look at today contrasting the two situations that are eerily similar. Um, Giovanni referenced the, the large complex in Arizona, the sort of the security complex. Um, Israel has been thickly involved in that for decades. And I want to read you a quote from um, the mayor of Tucson, who said, if you go to Israel and then come to southern Arizona and close your eyes and spin yourself a few times, you might not be able to tell the difference. So we're going to, as we go on, we're going to address particulars of the similarities and the involvement of Israel in our situation on the border. But it goes back decades into the 60s. Um, when Israel had uh, pretty thick um, activities in Guatemala, and then more recently here, as, as Giovanni has pointed out. Thank you, Giovanni. Giovanni also referenced some of the root causes. Let's hear more about that now from Alvaro. And give me just a minute, I want to bring up some slides that Alvaro uh, brought to accompany his presentation. So, Give me one minute to stumble through this technology, if you will. Good. Uh, my name is Alvaro. Uh, my name is uh, Alvaro uh, Rafael. Uh, I am from the uh, Cusca clan. That's the real name from my land. But in Spanish, it's El Salvador. What that means is, uh, you know, Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> I would like to talk about, you know, um, from the roots, why we are living in a country where pretty much uh, we have between 20 and 30 people getting killed every day. It's pretty hard to hear about that, but you know, um, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, how can I say it, uh, the media, they don't want to talk about the truth. And I've been afraid for years to talk about it because uh, it's a little bit, you know, hard to talk about that, that, that topic, right? So um, I brought some uh, images and pictures, and uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, in the same way, uh, I'm going to be showing some pictures about, about the situation. So uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this happened in 1932. So uh, some of my people, you know, like me, uh, we don't speak or language anymore. We speak Spanish. Because one of the reasons was, you know, uh, we were tired of uh, being oppressed for years and years and from the people taking our lands. And you know, and from there we become uh, workers. We didn't own our lands anymore. So, you know, our people start uh, getting organized and they start, you know, like fighting back against this empire. Can I say it? Um, so, can we go to the next one? So, uh, so from the 1932s to the, uh, the 80s, uh, we were all people were organizing on on the ground to, you know, to the guerrilla movements and figure out how are we gonna fight back against the oppression. And uh, I was a little young when all this happened, but I was between uh, all the bullets, all the helicopters, all these uh, armies throwing bombs on the our neighborhoods. So uh, when I start reading about Palestine, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, similar stuff, and you know, and so I, I try to educate myself. So I start, you know, reading about it. Uh, so <clears throat> that was in, uh, in our neighborhoods. 
if you can see it, you know, uh, us as a kids, that was our toys playing with the empty shows from the, from the army. Uh, and the place where I was living, we were having the army uh, behind in our neighborhood. So they were all the time, you know, uh, patrolling the communities and checking, you know, who was against the, the government. So one more time, you know, there's the empty shows. So <clears throat> why, uh, why right now, you know, we have so many uh, guns and weapons in my country? This is one of the reasons. This is how much money the Empire spent uh, in those 12 years. And you know, uh, it's so easy to find a weapon, a gun in my country. And it's so sad to see kids eight, nine years old with weapons protecting the or <clears throat> so from all this, all this situation on, from the Civil War, uh, some of our people started emigrating. One was my brother. He never understood you know, what happened to him. Uh, he, he came to New York and uh, for years and years he forgot about his, his history, what happened to him, and he doesn't want to talk about it. So, uh, <clears throat> In the 90s, uh, we were uh, in the ending the, the civil war in the South, but that was not paper. That wasn't real. All the guns, all the problems, all the psychotic situation, it was in the neighborhood. The situation in Sapo is about whoever has more power, whoever kills more people, whoever, you know, uh, oppresses another people. It's pretty sad to say it, but some people don't want to talk about it, but that's the, that's the reality. And the product of all these problems, you know, all these uh, people uh, getting deported back to El Sapo, and uh, we were having, you know, so many uh, people coming from, from here and telling us what to do. So from the beginning, we were having those problems with so many weapons already. So now they're coming back and they're telling us, you know what, this is your problem. And we're going to give you a solution. And what is the solution? More military training. More weapons. So, uh, for those years, you know, if you see the, the, the two persons on the, on, the, on the right side, on my left side, they are gang members. They were uh, getting divorced from Los Angeles. They left the country when they were a little kids. They didn't understand anything about the civil war or the situation. Why or, or what they were doing in different countries. So, <clears throat> for years, and even now, this is just 2014, and sorry it's in Spanish, but I can explain it to you. This is how much money I was spending every year in weapons in my country. And it's, it's sad, you know, and we say, you know, it's, El Sapo is a poor country. It's not. So, I mean, my question is, you know, where is all these weapons that they are coming from? And everybody knows, right? And this is legal. This is the legal, the legal way. Illegal, we had a lot of going on there. So this is now, this is the reality now in the Sapo. This is the, the police patrolling the streets, the neighborhoods. Some of these people, some of these kids over there, they don't belong to any gangs. But the police or the military, they don't care. If they see you in the wrong place, they're going to beat you up. And depends where they move, they're going to kill you. So. I was talking with somebody yesterday. Just from uh, this year, January 1st to yesterday, these 265 people getting killed. 50 belong to gang uh, problems. The other one, nobody knows about it. Can go to the next. I don't like to mention it, but I was in the military too. And this is what they were teaching me, to oppress people. You know? And for me, it was a little bit like, to understood, I was 16 years old. I didn't have an option. Both of my parents they were military, so they told me there and said, you know what, now you're gonna become a man. This is your future, this is what you're gonna be. So I was there, I was having questions. And one of the questions was, I mean, I had some pe uh, family who disappeared and the civil war. I was having questions about it. And they don't want to talk about it. They told me, you know what, you gotta, then you don't have those questions, whatever happened, whatever happened in the past, it's gonna stay in the past. So 
If you see right now, you know, like me, if I had tattoos, if they see me at the wrong place, <laughs> they can beat me up or they can take me to the office 72 hours. And those 72 hours, they can do whatever they want. So that's it, the world ends years back. It's not. This is the reality in some moment. I was talking with this person yesterday. And I was trying to throw the towel and say, you know what, I don't want to know anything about the situation. But he said, and he was telling me, you know what, we're not afraid of pain. We're afraid of this oppression. Because he has a boy, 16 years old. And they decided to, to take a picture of his face, putting on files. And now, he's a gang member. He's not. Why do they have to make that decision? So all the time what he has, or he, has, or he is in the wrong place, you know what's going to happen? He's going to take a break. But why? So what, is it, what do the kids do? They go, they go to, the, to the games. And they don't understand who is oppressing who. Because these kids, they are oppressing our communities too. And it's sad to say it, but they don't have uh, somebody in the front line and say, you know what? MS-13, they, they used in Los Angeles. And the way how they start is protecting our communities. But now it's different. And I'm going to explain you why. Let's go to the next. Uh, so I, I think you, know, you guys know uh, we are there in Southwest, a little, a little tiny country. A little tiny country. And we are now the capital motors of the world. That is sad. Uh, can we go to the next, please? So you know, and, and this picture, I go back and forth. And sometimes when I go over there, I try to convince people and tell them, you know what, to emigrate is not a solution. But sometimes they ask me, I mean, how can you say that you live over there? I go back and forth. I had a projects over there. And I ask my all the time, you know, why the means they are so powerful? Corruption. Corruption. From 2001, uh, all the parties in the summer, they started they, uh, start, uh, getting under the table. Only to the gangs. To fight the poor. Whoever is president right now is because he paid for it. And that's the truth. That is the way. They don't want to talk about it yet. I will say it. it's the truth. <coughs> and you know, <coughs> sorry. I had some friends like, <coughs> they were working with me in the streets. Now they are in jail. Nobody knows about it. Why? It's because the government, they don't want them to talk about the truth. And this is the truth. It's money, corruption, drugs. We're tired. You know, when I go to this neighborhood, because like I say, I go back and forth, I go to the worst neighborhoods. And I believe in the power of educating people. So if this case, they understand who is real, for real, the enemy, what do you think is going to happen? Everything will change. The government, they don't want to see that. Uh, can we go to the next, please? <coughs> this is my country. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can't go there anymore. I gotta wait for years and see what 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 what's gonna be uh, the solution if the violence is really is gonna change or it's not. But on the other hand, I had a question. You know, for people who's just getting off on the problem or entering into this country, we are part of the solution. That's what I believe. People who's, people has the right to emigrate, I believe that, but people has the right to go back and work in their communities. You know, and it's sad when I see people going back over there and getting deported, and the only thing what they do is, man, this country is sad. Man, this country is bad. You're responsible. You know why? Because you left. And when you left, you didn't care about it. Now, think about it. Think about it. What are you going to do? And they say, well, I'm going to try to survive. Some of these people get killed. And you guys know, because that is the media, that's what they say. We have so many different programs and organizations in the past working with gangs in the streets. Now, nobody wants to work with these people anymore. You know why? Because it's illegal. If you work with these people now, you're going to be in prison. So what's going to be the solution? More weapons, more kill, more people emigrating. You know, it's sad, but that's the, the reality. Can we go to the next one? So this is a little process what we do, and I believe in, uh, like I said, in the power of educating people through the art or through the sports. 
I've been working with kids in soccer for 20 years. For 20 years, we just had two gang members. Some of these kids, they are professional players. And I believe that you stay, and we can do the change. And you know, and I have people, like they see those kids coming to the United States. I think it's a solution, and the solution is a community. Work with the same community. It's no way that I'm gonna just turn around and say, you know what? They are the problem. If I do that, they are the problem. They will go to the last one. And this is in 2018. Some of my friends they didn't know anything about Palestine, but I was trying to talk to them and, and, and tell them why is that the it's so so similar. Even now, if we're not in civil war, 265 <coughs> people can be killed. It's bad, but that's the reality. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. You know, we get so caught up in our arguments about how much money and trade-offs of walls for doctors and so forth. <laughs> I'm really grateful to Alvaro. For reminding us what's at the heart of all this. You know, I, I can't... These two scenes... are on the streets every single day and have my in the West Bank, just as they are in El Salvador. And I've already pointed those similarities out. So the same, the same systemic issues are going on all the time. Money and weapons, as most of you know, I think, we send, the United States sends $4 billion every year to Israel, every year for years and years and years. But no matter what our economy is doing, doesn't matter what's going on, $4 billion goes to Israel for, for weapons. A lot of that comes back. Um, thank you, Alvaro. Elaine. We rarely hear the voices of people who are trying to enter the U.S. Will you share some of your experiences working with immigrants and refugees? Thank you very much. The journeys of those who come to the southern border to enter USCN territory are as unique as snowflakes, and yet there are commonalities and patterns. I began to know these stories when I returned to Austin in 2010 after living and teaching in Mexico for over four years. My story isn't as important as those of the people I want to tell you about. But let's say I wanted to work where my facility with Spanish would allow me to help immigrants from Spanish-speaking countries. Starting in 2011, I began participating in the Huddle Visitation Program, visiting women incarcerated in the detention center in Taylor, Texas. For the next two years, I met women from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Tibet, Nicaragua, Brazil, Congo, and Cameroon. The women told me of violence that came out of the cartel economies that the U.S. government had engendered in the Northern Triangle. The reasons that drove them to leave their homes and family ranged from cartel taxes that impoverished, police and military collusion and corruption, toxic patriarchal traditions and violations of every kind. This is what they were fleeing, and when they were placed in detention centers designed to enrich the owners and stockholders of the private prison industry. The threat that emerged from almost all the women I visited over the next years. The first thing the women talked about was the process of being thrust into the cement holding cells of the border patrol before being sent 
to the different detention centers. The word the women use is ielevas, ice boxes, where some were held for days with no warm clothing and little food and water. One Honduran woman told me that she was put into one of these late at night and was terrified to see what she thought were dead bodies covered in aluminum sheets, and she started to scream. One woman came out from under her mylar blanket and calmed her, saying that no, they weren't dead, and that she should just lie down and get some sleep. One Salvadoran woman I know spent 18 months incarcerated in Hutto. She has won a provisional stay, but is now facing deportation under the extreme policies of Agent Orange's immigration justice overlords. She works, pays taxes, is active in her church, and in Casa Marianela, which gave her shelter and a place to be released to after detention. Casa Marianela originated over 30 years ago when the first waves of asylum seekers from the brutal military regimes of the Naranja Triangle landed in Austin. CASA has existed with dormitory quarters for single men and women in a group of houses on Austin's east side. Until 12 years ago, CASA Marianella realized that women and children were appearing at their doorstep and they knew they couldn't house vulnerable women and children alongside single men and women. One of their benefactors brought them, bought them a house for women and children. It is called Postada Esperanza, Refuge of Hope. There are now four houses on a quiet cul-de-sac, and that is where women from Congo, Mexico, Guatemala, Cameroon, Cuba, El Salvador, and Honduras live with their children. Some have husbands still in detention. The impunity with which the Border Patrol operates was exposed in early December with the death of a seven-year-old girl from Guatemala while in custody. She was a Quiche speaker whose life meant little to the Customs and Border Patrol agents who caught her and her father in the New Mexican desert. Then a second child, a boy, also from Guatemala, died on Christmas Eve. We know that the indigenous immigrants face a doubly problematic linguistic barrier. There are at least 21 distinct Mayan languages spoken in Guatemala alone. Hardworking immigration lawyers, many who work pro bono, are often caught with interpreters who can speak the many different languages spoken by the people of the Northern Triangle. A woman I visited while she and her son were held at the Carnes Detention Center is a mom speaker. When it was time for her to speak before the immigration official, her attorney had found a mom speaker to interpret. But there are many different dialects of mom and the interpreter did not speak the one my friend spoke. She was unable to understand any of the questions being asked. She had no real idea what was being asked of her. Her story of sexual abuse and threats from the family of her abuser went untold, and her first asylum claims were denied. Linguistic isolation is a prevalent issue in the detention centers. There are many women who have learned Spanish while in detention. But not all immigrants who come to the southern border speak Spanish. During my visits to the Hutto Detention Center, I thought that my limited French was actually useful due to the women from Francophone Africa who also come to the southern border. I heard stories of travels that might begin in Congo, 
pass through Somalia or another African country before flying to Brazil or Ecuador, which have more open immigration policies. I met one Ethiopian woman who traveled with two young daughters while pregnant with the son who was born in Brazil. They walked, caught rides, bought bus tickets when they could until they, like others, moved through Central America and Mexico. Then they crossed the borders of the United States after months of travel across oceans and continents. They then end up in detention for months or years. It is really important to note the economic factor in the creation of the immigration detention system. People are making money off the incarceration of immigrants. Millions upon millions of dollars are given to the owners and stockholders of the private prison corporations that profit so boldly from immigration policies. Two of the most notable are Geo and Core Civic, each of which owns and operates family detention centers right south of San Antonio. Geo operates one center in Carmel City and Core Civic one in Dilly. Core Civic used to be called the CCA or the Corrections Corporation of America until so much bad press made them change their name. This is terrible, Mike. Can you hear me without it? Yeah. No. no, okay. I'll keep it. The name changed. But the acts, the practice of inadequate staffing, bad food, abuse, and neglect remain. The poisonous mix of racism and greed have contributed to the actual crisis at the border. The crisis is not about the security of US citizens, but the crisis is of how our country persecutes and profits from those seeking asylum and sanctuary. The crisis is the immorality of refusing to help those fleeing for their lives. Fortunately, there are many who push back on these deadly policies. Currently on trial in Tucson is a member of No More Deaths, who leave water and food in the desert. The Intercept has just published an excellent article about this case. The in and there are scores of visitation programs in the detention centers that have crept onto the American landscape in the last years. There are, excuse me, um, and there are lawyers and immigration law clinics who battle daily to prevent deportation. One must not forget the volunteers at Casa Mariadella in Austin, Annunciation House in El Paso, or the Interfaith Welcome Coalition right here in San Antonio. All these exist because of people of conscience, like those of you who came here today. Well, I think language 
is not, uh, the language is extremely consequential. I think we're taught from an early age that words won't hurt you. And I think that you know, when you study policy, when you study culture, you see that words produce narratives which produce policies, which intervene on relationships, which can, which can produce consequences which lead to life and death. They're not just words. Um, it's not just air. Um, the language of terrorism is something that I'm particularly interested in. And I think that the current discourse of terrorism is one that's based on false logic and a faulty correlation. Just last year, Robert Bowers, who was the mass shooter of the Tree of Life Synagogue, was not labeled a terrorist by the president. It was an issue of debate. I mean, from the standpoint of the action, there is it is undoubtedly terrorist. Yet, we do not call it terrorism. And not calling it terrorism produces another set of actions. It means that it won't be prosecuted like a terrorist. It means that there won't be policy changes to prevent that action from happening. So that label is extremely consequential ter of terrorism because there's a, there's a there's a whole industry that seeks to prevent terrorism that is more funded than the industry that tries to prevent gun violence. Right? So there are more resources that, that um, come from the label terrorism than gun violence. So that's very consequential. Um, so then what is terrorism? I think, you know, I teach at Trinity and I teach students who, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. And you know, at, at this stage, we're 18, 19, past, 18, how many years past 9-11, we have evolved conversations, we know, you know, we shouldn't be explaining, okay, terror, it, all Muslims are terrorists, that's an obvious point at this stage. Yet, the, the way that terrorist has been come to be understood by many young people is still that of a Muslim. Um, and it's very inflexible in terms of how it's being defined. So what ends up happening with that definition is that it criminalizes people, right? And so Muslim terrorism becomes, it, it continues at this stage to be interchangeable by a certain segment of its population. And so as a result, let's to think about the immigration and order issue. You know, we have people that are, that are trying to come to this country for a better life, right? Article 13 of the International Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, says that everyone has a right to leave their country and to return to their country. And we're in a situation where there are many people all over the world through civil conflict or through poverty that are from Muslim countries that, that want to leave. And will do whatever it takes to get to a safe place, and many people are trying to come to the United States. So, yes, there may be people from the Muslim world that are coming through the southern border. Right? You're giving examples, you're seeing this in detention. I've seen the examples here in San Antonio, uh, people that have come through the southern border. But they are a minority. It's, I, we don't have numbers. There's no way to have numbers. But it is a very small percentage of people that might be a Muslim background that are coming through. But the fact that they're Muslim automatically creates suspicion. Right? So you know, I think the objective is not to say, oh, well, there are no Middle Easterners coming through the southern border. Well, yeah, there might be some. And there, there are cases where this has been known to happen. They're not dropping their prayer rugs on the border, as uh, Donald Trump is suggesting, because that's just completely false. There's no evidence. And you don't need a prayer rug to pray. FYI, you can just <laughs> put your head on the ground. That is the last, you, you don't have, you can't carry a lot of things. There's no need to carry a prayer rug. Um, so, so the point here is that, yes, there might be small numbers coming, but because of this criminalization, the international criminalization of Muslims through the label of terrorists, sort of creates the narrative 
of the threat at the border. It, it, it magnifies the narrative of the threat. And it is a false, it is a false claim, totally false. So I want to, I think that um, it's useful to sort of take the step back and think about sort of how and why we've arrived at this particular situation where the narrative used to advance Trump's logic of the wall is one of terrorism, right? I think that terrorism at this moment in America does not feel like an existential threat. Maybe it did in 2001. In 2001, Americans had a shock, right? It, we, we faced the largest terrorist attack in our history, right? In 2001, the borders were permeable, more so than they are today. And so I think it's important to kind of take a step back and to think about, okay, well, if we were, if we felt this existential threat in 2001, how come here we are in 2018 and we're insisting on, or 2019, and, and Trump is insisting on this wall to protect us uh, from terrorism. So I think it's, um, it's, it was interesting, I you know, went back and sort of did a little bit of research on this, and, and yes, there is, you know, immigrants from the southern border have been criminalized since the drug war. So it, the criminalization of migrants predates 9-11 from the drug war, but, 9-11 definitely catalyzed that. But right, you know, in, the, in 2001 and 2002, um, border security in the southern border did not necessarily increase. And I think that's really interesting. So uh, what, what happened during that time was that actually um, personnel on the border patrol migrated from the southern border to the northern border. The northern border was seen as one that was that was more vulnerable. And so there was a shift, and the southern border seemed like it was relatively safe. And, and it took some time, over years, where um, actually, you know, at the time, I find this really interesting, because I went back and I read a little bit, and, you know, Edward Alden of the Council on Foreign Relations actually describes Tom Ridge, who was the first Homeland Security Chief, as having um, an attitude of open borders. I find that really interesting and actually quite shocking. Tom Ridge, Bush administration and the early Homeland Security was believed in open borders, right? And if we think about today, the language of open borders, it is seen as you know, this far left position, right? When in fact, there was sort of a capitalist, neoliberal argument for open borders that we often forget. And that sort of the open border left and then the open border capitalists are strange bedfellows in this situation that it's completely been overshadowed by, by the current discourse of the Republican Party. And, and that, that former discourse has kind of disappeared, right? It was a, in open borders, signal prosperity, right? Because it created opportunities for, you know, the best and the brightest to leave their countries and to come and work in the United States, right? And that's seen as a good thing for America, but also for labor. So this combination of labor, of creating open borders for labor and creating um, open borders for, um, for technology and industry, um, that was seen as, that was, that was, that was a desire of even the Bush administration, um, and more so than I would say compared to Obama, and then compared to um, obviously Trump. So, so the initial goal of Tom Ridge in the Department of Homeland Security was to try to balance the desire for prosperity with security. It was a difficult balancing act, and from the standpoint of the sort of white supremacist nativist like Lou Dobbs that was seen as hypocritical. And so the discourse about the, uh, the, the existential threat of the migrant was something that you know, started to um, take hold during that time. In Arizona, with people like Lee Dobbs and Fox News, started to 
sort of question the administration, saying, why don't we consider the southern border? Why don't we add more security to the southern border? And that particular discourse, which was like about 10 years ago, has a champion in the White House right now. That's something that is currently, it started with him, started with that particular discourse, and now we have the president sort of taking on that same same um, language. And so, you know, the Republican Party has been sort of split from borders being one of potential prosperity, but the sort of nativist discourse of the Republican Party has taken over. So closing the borders is seen as part of a, a broader desire for national security, which is laced in um, nativist language. Um, I think that uh, getting back to language and getting back to 9-11, I think that this, what happens and what's continu continually happening through Twitter, through the right wing media, is this creating this correlation between borders and terrorism. If you repeat it enough, it becomes seen as a fact. You put these two images together and it's taken for granted. And it becomes the rationale for the wall and free security. But I want to take us back to. Um, to post sort of uh, immediately after 9-11 with this sort of association that people had between 9-11 and Saddam Hussein, right? That's an example of a completely false correlation that became the basis for a trillion dollar war in Iraq, right? This is actually something that I did my research on towards my PhD that this, this association between Saddam Hussein and 9-11 was something that was seen as fact and it was true. But it, as we know, it was a lie that there was any connection with Iraq and 9-11. So here we are, 2018, in theory the war is over, but there's huge consequences. But when we have these basically these lies that produce policy, we also have a culture that does not go back and reflect or sort of discuss the fact that you have a policy based on lies. And I think this is kind of a problem that we have in this country. How do we go back and sort of say, oops, that was a mistake, oops, this was not something we should have done. But it's something that was produced through this association, these false associations. So I think we're back kind of in that place where we have these associations around this around borders and sort of the security around these threats, these false threats. They're not real threats to the nation. Um, and so I think um, I think this is something that I just like to stop with because this is something that I don't I don't know. There, I don't think there's hope in terms of sort of going back and, and taking responsibility for these false associations. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's a lot there that we might want to dive into during our question and answer time. But first, let's thank the panel for what they brought to We're going to open it up for questions in just a minute, but first I want to ask the panelists um, to just offer, up, after all this conversation, what we want to do is to suggest or offer up um, what we can walk out of here with. It's nice to come and listen, but okay, what can we go do now? What, what, what are some actions we can take um, if we're moved to take an action? So let me just ask the panel to, um, to offer any suggestions. Um, for what, what folks here might do in, in this regard, whatever it is. Anyone? Yes. Um, Come on. You guys hear me? Yeah. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. You hear me now? Right, um, yes, to, to answer that question, um, and I would just, I was asked the same question just a few minutes ago. I was interviewed by, uh, 
you ask myself the question, you know, what, what is, what would I like for people um, hearing the panel, or for people coming to listen to the panel, you know, what would be the takeaway from them, right? Uh, one of the things was to get involved, right? Uh, it's not enough to just come here and get educated, or come here and get receiving information, and just go home and to do whatever you do before you came here, and that's it, right? Um, we need to get involved. We need to, we need to um, make demands, you know? Make demands of people who are making these policies, right? Um, we need to go see firsthand. You know, we only get two hours away from the border, two or two or three hours away from the border, go see firsthand. There is a, there is a lot of organizations uh, here in San Antonio uh, that do work on the border. Um, find them, we should find them, we should. Join them. We should, um, like I said, get involved. You know, not just sit and wait every two hours, two years cycle for the next election because this is not something to get involved. It's not something to get resolved by spending two minutes at the ballot box. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. This is something that actually takes. This takes time. Actually, take energy. Actually, take. You know, people have to get involved in being out there, right? Um, and that would be one of the suggestions, get involved, get involved with things. Um, also, I was recently in in a in a conference uh, where I met Laura Castellis. I'm not sure if you've heard of Laura Castellis. She is the daughter of Penta Castellis um, from Honduras, who was a uh, environmentalist activist who was murdered by uh, security forces, you know, right? Um, and the question was asked to her, you know, she was leading the panel, she was leading the discussion, the, the question was asked was, what can we do? Uh, you know, what do you need? Do we need, can we send money? Can we send uh, clothing? Can we send uh, this or that? You know, there's children, can we send you know, toys or whatnot? It's all good, it's all fine, that it's all good for the immediate needs, you know? Uh, blankets and all that, what we look for the needed thing, right? But one of the things that she suggested, right, is change your government. <laughs> you know, change, change your government. That's, that's what you can do for the long term, change your government. Um, and with this, I just leave that to reflect on, pass it on to uh, You want as I think Sister Sharon is here, who works with the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. Are there, how, if you're involved with the Interfaith Welcome Coalition here in San Antonio, would you raise your hands, please? So the people, are you see, this is what you've got going here in San Antonio. It's a wonderful organization, and if you're looking to connect, these are the people, yeah, bravo. Uh, because um, people heard stories about immigrants being dumped at Greyhound stations during these moments, and it's the folks in the Interfaith Welcome Coalition who actually are at the Greyhound station interpreting and helping people get their tickets. Some of us came down from Austin a couple of years ago one night, and it was quite extraordinary what happens there. So that's one thing. The second thing, um, Myra, would you raise your hand so people can see you? This is our friend, Myra Sheikh, who's the executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations in Austin. And on January 29th is what's called Muslim Day at the Capitol. And perhaps when we break up, you might want to go talk to Myra, or perhaps Judith can send out the form to the, to the list, there's a list back there, because there are ways that you can get involved, because as Giovanni said, it is about changing the government. There's a way to actually work, to work out the, le the legislation that is about to be coming up. And Myra can also give you more information about the, one of the current legal cases progressing through the courts here with the Palestinian American um, speech therapist, um, Baliyah Amawi, 
um, and talking about her case against the ridiculous legislation that was passed in the last legislature about not being able to work if you are against the boycott, divest, and sanction group. So those are just two things I'd like to add. Um, I want to I just mention uh, something very quick um, about the caravan and about other immigrants coming to the United States. I think it's, uh, how can I say it so it doesn't hear <laughs> I think it's our responsibility to educate immigrant people because they didn't end uh, coming just to the United States and start new life. For me, they have to go back. They have to go back and we've got to fix all, uh, all problems. Well, I don't want to see uh, any, like, you know, churches, localities going back to my country and fixing the problem. And I am responsible for that problem, too. So for me, uh, my responsibility, and I think about what those kids coming to, to this country. I don't want to see those kids fighting against my kids. So it's my responsibility to educate my kids and their kids. Because um, you know, it's a lot of people here from San Antonio, and you know, you know, I am involved in pretty much in whatever I can. And uh, the situation is, you know, the reason why I'm doing this is because I believe in the community. I believe in the power of getting together and fight back as a group. And uh, my friends, uh, I want, I'm gonna let them talk about. Uh, they're gonna explain what I do in the. It's going to be the next. Hello. Um, thank you for everybody that's on the panel. Um, it's really informative. Um, I'm not going to ask the uh, U.S. come to me this week and he's um, somebody who's helping us understand what we're doing. Um, my name is Alejandro Garza and I'm a tribal member of the Cabezo Comitul Tribe of Texas. And we have Juan Macias back there at the table. Uh, our information table, and he is our tribal chairman. And um, when we're talking about the crisis, and then we have people in here also that are at our camp, our village, uh, our Somiset village based camp that we're doing. We're going to talk about that right now. But um, I think the perspective that we have as native people, as original people of this region, is um, we're talking about immigration, we're talking about borders, we're talking about occupation. And for people that never left, right, our right to stay, our right to to be able to practice our life ways, our right to be who we are, um, and then not be told that we are the immigrants when you know we were not, not we are not the immigrants, you know, and also when we're looking at the continent and the man-made borders of the that being enforced, but really it's just militarization is really just enforcing. The, the occupation of these lands uh, and because of the resources, right? Because of the resources that people want to extract, especially now with all the extraction that's happening. And that's why, that's why we're here. Just um, to remind people that we're human. I think the mother earth, or grandmother earth, she's reminding us also that we need to go back to being human. And we need to go back to thinking about these things. And, when we're talking about the crisis on the border, um, we are going to be opposing that border wall that um, the so-called so -called president says that he wants to build. And we're doing that because those are our ancestral lands, our traditional ancestral lands, and that wall is going to be detrimental to the entire community ecology of the region. So it doesn't just mean on one side of the border or the other side of the border, because it seems like only you know, uh, it's only meant to enforce that occupation, so it's, it's kind of like that's going to be affecting the ocelots, it's going to be affecting the butterflies, it's going to be affecting us as people in our relationship with with the animals and with every all the living things that are in that region. So that's why it's very important that we not allow that wall to go up. Aside from the fact of the increased militarization, which has always been a problem, and the human rights violations. Um, that people will be, be 
doing is that whenever there's been those sections of a wall that have been built, it's been to, they say, deter migration, but by like forcing people to, to change their migration routes, right? To change our uh, ancestral migration routes and use routes that are much more dangerous, that are basically putting us in a life or death situation. And that's how they're deterring this. Death is a deterrent for people. And that's that's why that wall is there. It's, it's to promote that death. And that's why we see that policy of people. Because um, I, I worked in Arizona, and it, it's just the same the same policy, but it's being done here. And so what we're doing is we're building these villages. We're restoring our, our accessible villages. And we're doing this because we want to remind people and we want to be able to protect our and preserve our traditional ancestral lands. And um, if you would like to be able to support us building these villages, then um, I suggest that you go and sign up at the back, and um, also we're just going to be, um, and also we're offering anybody that wants to come help and work, work with us, uh, but that's like physical labor and solidarity, um, all is welcome, and I don't know if Juan has something you'd like to add. Can you give me a minute? Can you give me a minute? Okay, we want to allow time for questions. Right, okay, I'll just one minute, I'll, I just want to say a few things. Uh, and I know you can hear me, but I'll use the microphone. Uh, they just, uh, a couple of days ago, announced that they had uh, found out that they had found some remains in Eagle Pass where they were built, where they have the strip mine that is selling gold, that is selling coal to Mexico. And they took those human remains and they buried them secretly somewhere else. Now, they waived the Native American grace Protection and Repatriation Act. They waived the American Indian Religious Freedom Act bid to build this wall. We're going to be up right against the wall, up against protecting a cemetery that has some of our tribal uh, ancestors that are buried there, but also that has World War I and World War II veterans. And we're going to, we've already started, we're going over there tomorrow to set up the camp. And they're, they already know that we're there. And if you want, if you want, want to come out, come out to the, to the village of Somisek. That's where we're at, out here in Corso, it's not too far. And you can see what you can hear the rest of the story because 22 people in the last two years have died a lot at the hands of the border patrol or the ICE agents, and nobody's questioning that. A young lady from Honduras got shot seven months ago. Nobody has said anything. There is no accountability for ICE. Homeland Security, and when they build that wall, they're going to build martial law all along that that those, that that mile long strip that they're building. They're not building it on the river; they're building it two miles away from the border. So we're giving up United States territory for them to do whatever they want with people that come along. There. But what they what they don't know is that once you get on this land, you can ask for asylum, and they have they have to grant it. To so I just want to let you know that we're trying to teach people. And these villages will be exactly that, is to teach that. I want to introduce uh, J.R. American Horse from the Lakota Sioux at Standing Rock. He was there. He was one of the chiefs there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that there are some people who are going to want to talk to you and maybe ask some questions. So if you could, yeah, great. Um, so, what? I was going to go to questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Whichever. No, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, our time is running down, and I do want to, to um, allow time for people to ask questions if you have some. And I want to go into that um, with a poem, a poem uh, part of which you all are familiar with. It may have some connotations or associations for you, but um, let's just take a minute to just listen to the words of the poem in the context of our conversation today. This was written by a Jewish American woman in the 19th century. She was not an immigrant, but her forebears were. And as she grew up and she learned about the story of her um, ancestors who immigrated to the US because of persecution um, in their homelands. Um, she became an activist for justice and, um, and she wrote this poem. 
not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand blows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your story pomp, cries she, the sun lips. Give me your tired. Send these, the homeless. Tennis toss to me. Others my life beside the golden door. Let's have some questions. If you have if you have questions for an individual, please direct them to the individual. Um, or if you have a general question, just uh, whoever wants to give me an answer. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for having the panel. I think it's a very, uh, I think it's essential to have these type of discussions. Uh, and I would like to um, kind of comment, but also ask, you know, uh, Giovanni raised the question that we need to, to uh, the, like a change of government, or somebody had said that. And, but the difficult part is what type of government, because I would like to comment that uh, uh, under the demo, demo, uh, the Democrat government has have happened a lot of things, like, in 1995, under the Operation Gatekeeper, under Clinton, a lot of people died in one of the, like, the, uh, 14 people died in Victoria, you know, that time. So that was under the uh, Democrats. And, uh, and also in uh, the New York Times published in September 13 of 2016, that Obama gave Netanyahu at that time 38 million in military aid. And on that article, they said he gave more aid not to the Israeli uh, the, uh, uh, authorities than any of his predecessors, you know. And so I think that's the difficult part. What type of war? Because should they can say that they are not a brand, but what type of democracy? That's what I think the other is like. If people come into these countries because this country uh, has gone to the country like in America, the Middle East, Africa, to accumulate, them, to accumulate the, all this wealth. So people can't do for that, no, because people want to leave their land. And I think that's one of the, the other things that they can't do. Here on the home, we have a lot of problems. You know, we, we need money for education. We need, we need money you know, to take care of all people. So why don't we take care of your own problems at home instead of going to other countries? Those are that way to do that. So what I'm going to do is that they are really helping And they, they can get in the most water, you know,
So, kind of paradigma, uh, the whole thing about the novel is that, that you, guys, you guys know, some of you have been overseas and everything, uh, Italy, the country of Italy, is a relatively young country. Italy as a country is younger than the United States, you guys didn't know that. Uh, Italy was divided into different kingdoms and, and principalities, and some of, some of Italy belonged to Austria, you know, and some of them belonged to France. You know, so, so it just recently it just happened into the 1880s that Italy unified and became what you, what you see here today, right? Um, so there was this there was this guy, or there was this the whole thing about Catalanismo is that the, uh, the the general that was doing the pushing for unification in Italy, right? His name is uh, Garibaldi, right? We were pushing for it, you know, and pretty much going through these different villages, these different kingdoms, right, pretty much uh, pressuring for the unification of Italy, right? And there was this principality where this guy, right, he wanted to do reforms, you know, do a little reform, right? But the whole thing is that he wanted, he wanted to keep the, this little principality as it was. So he did some reform to appease uh, the central government, right? But at the same time, to keep things as they, as they were, right? So that's what worked out about these came to be, right? It is to initiate reforms, to keep things the way it is. Does that make sense? Sure. Right. That's what capitalism came about, right? To maintain the status quo. Um, when we talk about close, a close political system, means that in the United States, that regardless who wins the White House, whether it's, whether it's uh, blue or red, the policy stays the same. You know, particularly foreign policy stays the same, it doesn't really get out of course. What happens is, right, they make adjustments and fine tune it, this and that, you know, but still the same goals are the same, regardless of who's in office. Yeah. So when Laura was talking about change the government, she didn't mean change John Trump. She made to change the whole structure of things operating here, you know, which they over there are the ones that that have, are having to live with the brunt of the outcomes of what happened here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Did you have a response? Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that obviously it's false to think that the only way of being political is signing up for elections and voting and getting behind a candidate. We know that that's, that that's a very limited conception of being political. And I think that we just, but if you do look at the parties and you do look at how they've shifted, both the Democrats and the Republicans, and the, you know, the Republican policy just is somewhat unrecognizable to, to sort of the senior Republicans or the older ones. But I think that, I think that part of changing the government is also changing the public discourse and changing the public culture. And that's, that's a long game. And that has to be strategic. And I think, like, sometimes there's, there's a, we have our, we don't want to come across to be too radical, or maybe you don't, maybe you don't care about that. Um, I, I sometimes will just not say anything. Um, but I think that we need to make radical normal. And I think that we need to think, how do we do that? I think, like, you know, we see little bits of it happening. We might not always agree with who that person is. But it, it's like just shifting what is normal. And that this whole, that, that can be done, because it has been done. And it takes work, and it takes some strategy. But, it's, but I think that it's public culture and discourse that has to, that, and then government will follow. So on. I just want to add to what Giovanni and Habiba said also, that it is true. Voting alone is not enough, but joining the parties is very important right now. If we want to bring a change, it, change has to come from within. We have to be inside, not from outside. So running for any kind of offices is the answer. That's the only way. It cannot be done overnight, you're right. But man, each one of you can run for an office. Each one of you can join the party, if nothing else, become the precinct chairs. That is quite a powerful position. 
because it changed the party's thinking from inside. So it is important, I think, we've been saying, oh, be active in the elections, you know, go vote and all that. That is also important, no doubt about it. But I think the time has come. If we have to make a change, we have to go inside. Yes, sir. I think my, uh, I've got a microphone built in so you could hear me good. Um, I'm only a visitor from here, from North Dakota. <clears throat> we've been in the, we've been in the uh, pipeline fight there, and they use a lot of force. But the idea of how you got to look back at 1984 when they introduced the executive order in Washington. Executive order came about this eminent domain, and it never really came into prosperity until the president slowly started to work on that, on that eminent domain to take over the land, the water, the, the railroads, the highways, the airports, everything that's coming into effect in the land, your rent, your houses, they can remove your house anytime you, they want. That's that executive order. And then also the other one is uh, the mass incarceration, it's called docket law, the mass incarceration for minorities. Okay, that's, well, that's what's to keep up the court system. So when they put some of the, right now you have a lot of uh, children in, uh, in, in locked up, that, they're making money off of them. And so he, Sessions, when he got an office in, in uh, January of 17, he brought up that law, that docket law, and he introduced it and wanted to uh, eliminate it. And uh, 45 minutes later, he withdrew his motion. So they left it in there. And they, and they, and they uh, still uh, try to keep them, that um, <clears throat> great prison that's open in, in Ohio. Guatemala, Guatemala, what do you call it, that, that prison. So, and then there's, um, Obama closed down 134 Walmarts. They're making them into concentration camps. So this is what, you probably might want to visit the docket law and the, and the uh, uh, EO called executive order. Those were created in 1984. So some of you that are kind of uh, into computers, you might want to look that up and, and, and maybe re revisit and have our, have our uh, leaders of our state and the governors to visit that. So thank you for listening. Thank you. So part of the job of a moderator is to put a damper on everything. <laughs> and I have to do that now because this library closes at 5 o'clock. Closes. So it's 25 till now, and I know the nature of people is to want to visit and talk and everything, so what I'm sorry to have to do, but have to, because every one of us in this room has to be outside the library at 5 o'clock, is to adjourn the program and, and allow some time for folks to visit with each other. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, let's do that on a one-by-one -one basis. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.